here this evening. I'm so grateful you would all come out tonight to um, participate in this very interesting and intriguing topic. I'm sure when you told friends where you were headed to, they had questions. So hopefully after this event, you'll be able to fill them in with some more information. So uh, my name is Jillian Doucette Campbell. I work here at the Cathedral Church. I am the engagement leader. And uh, before we dive into this evening's presentations, I do have a few housekeeping notes. Um, accessible washrooms just outside the door here to the left. Um, the, following the presentations, we will have a time for question and answer. So we have three guests. They will share their presentations this evening, and then we will have um, the Q&A time. So if you think you're going to forget your question, I do have some lovely people over there who will be happy to distribute to you some pens and paper. Um, so if you need any, just wave your hand, and they'll, they'll be happy to bring you over the beautiful putty-colored paper. So. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the organizers of Good Grief Nova Scotia for creating this week of events designed to support givers, um, to, to support grievers in our communities and to grow grief literacy across Nova Scotia and beyond. So uh, let's just give a round of applause for those. I know some people have gone to events. Thank you. And also, um, if you see me wave this stick, that's to let our speakers know they have five minutes remaining. So don't be alarmed, but do be alarmed if you see me starting to get up with the stick, because I will use it. Um, so now, on a more serious note, uh, let's take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory upon which we are gathered here this evening. So we pause to acknowledge that we are Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq, or Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1726. Now these treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. So may each of us here actively seek a new relationship as treaty people, one that is based in honor and deep respect. So now I would like to invite our first guest for this evening. This, uh, our guest is the Reverend Canon Dr. Jody Clark. He is the professor of pastoral theology at the Atlantic School of Theology here in Halifax. And as an educator, researcher, and practitioner, Jody's focus is in the areas of trauma studies, personality theory, dying, and bereavement. And Jody enjoys exploring the complexity, messiness, and triumphs found within the human journey and has published a number of articles on these themes, including um, psycho-spiritual diagnosis, character change, and human resilience. And in addition to his academic work, Jody is vigilant in remaining as close as he can to the front lines of the human journey as he continues to work within parish ministry and healthcare contexts. Thank you, Jody. Thanks, Jillian. So uh, I have a handout for you, because sometimes people come and they take notes and things like that. This way, here are your notes. You don't have to worry about taking notes. You can just sit back, and, and if you need to fall asleep, you can do that too. So here you go. I'll just kind of go back over that. Super duper. Okay, great. If you need some more, that's great. So it's really nice to be with you. So what I'm going to do is I've got a timer here because I don't want Jillian to take me out with that freaking thing, right? So no kidding. Like, really, I, I'm an aversion to being eh, taken out by a candy cane. Like, seriously, right? <laughs> Try to explain that to your friends. What happened to you, Joe, Jody? Oh, I was knocked out by a candy cane. So I've got this here, and I've got 11 minutes on it. We're, gonna, we're on it. OK, cool. So I'm, we're talking really about sustainable dying. And what I want to do tonight, the next uh, 
10 minutes and 58 seconds is talk a little bit about what stops us from being sustainable as human beings in the face of those things. Um, so that's really the focus of what I want to look at today, or this evening. When we talk about someone receiving a diagnosis of a terminal illness, um, we, people experience both the, both the individual and the, the people, their families and friends, and the thing called anticipatory grief. In other words, begin the grieving process when people receive that diagnosis, right? So already we've got instability here, right? Is that fair? Like all of a sudden the world, one trajectory is going on, and suddenly with the diagnosis, things begin to change. We could, talk, we could break down even that diagnostic period and all of its fluctuations too with remissions and relapses, remissions and relapses, right? So it's a really foggy time and you want to get as much information from specialists as you possibly can and they're gone, they've gone on vacation for a month, and he, right? You all know those stories. So it becomes really murky territory there. Most people in our society are not prepared for the intensity of the emotional reality that surrounds the event, the death event. So most people aren't ready for it. Now, if you do any grief work, and you've already been doing some of the workshops this week, um, Lindemann's study in 1944, Massachusetts, the New England Journal of Medicine, phenomenal article, written about the 1939 Coconut Grove. You're from all, most of you are familiar with that very famous fire. 280 university students are killed. And about six months later, uh, uh, Lindemann is, the, is a psychiatrist at Massachusetts General. And he has people coming in six months after the fire with physiological manifestations of grief, right? Or they're, or they're just coming in, they've got um, stomach aches, they can't sleep, they've got cramps, they've got ongoing diarrhea, they've got um, IBS, they've got all these physiological symptoms. And as they were doing the medical write-ups of all these people, this huge wave of people that hit six months after the Coconut Grove fire, he found that most of those people with these physiological symptoms had lost somebody in the fire. Right? So he, Lindemann in, in 44 begins to say, and see, this is true for all of us, that when we receive that diagnosis, or when somebody, somebody tells us about that diagnosis, we physically feel it. So on top of the illness, you've got other physical things going on. Your body is responding in a different way to the phenomena too. So there's, it's double pressure. We think, oh, it's just the cancer, or it's just whatever the malignancy is that people are dealing with, but actually it's more than that because you have all these emotional things going on as well. Does that sound fair? And those things are often lost too. So the work I do is with that piece, right? The, it's the piece, all those emotional pieces that go into that phenomena. So that's the importance of of, of the work. And look, check it out. Everybody here who's had a grief experience, where did you feel it? Where did you feel it? Yeah, right in here, didn't you? Like really, honest to God, remember that grief experience? You felt it physically here. So it's really important for us to be aware of where we actually begin to feel the experience of the loss. I'm going to hit three really quick things that I think are critical. Attachment, it's all about attachment theory and about attachment. There can be no grief without attachment, but there can be grief because there were, but there, but there can be grief because there were no attachments. <laughs> In other words, you can sometimes grieve the fact that there wasn't an attachment. And as clergy, we bump into this stuff all the time, right? Somebody says, "Yeah, my dad's dead. Uh, I, I, I really don't care about that. What I care about is that I never had a dad. The grief of not having the father, the absent father. So." Grief is really about attachment. And it's because you love somebody, you all know this, that you really feel the most acute kind of grief experience, right? So it's really critical for us to understand that. Now this is also really important when we talk about sustainability. Um, and that is mirror theory. Mirror theory is I get to see you. So I see Marion, Marion sees me, we reflect each other back. And I have all kinds of really big mirrors in my life. So right now in my life, my biggest, my biggest mirror is my wife, Beth, right? She's my biggest mirror. If I'm having a bad day, I go to see Beth. She reflects me back, right? We all have people like that in our lives. And I have two daughters, and they reflect me. They're the other two big mirrors in my life. So I got three huge mirrors. My mom's still alive. When, when I was two, my mom was the biggest mirror, right? As I got older, she got smaller. Now, she didn't like that, but she got smaller as a mirror. Right? So if we lose those mirrors, if those mirrors get smashed, 
right? Or if, if, and this is really interesting for the dyeing process, if during the dyeing process that mirror changes. So I was working once with a kid who, a uh, young man who, whose father was dying, but he didn't tell anybody because it was really difficult to tell somebody because everybody saw your dad's this big guy, he's a big successful businessman, but his father was dying and his father was getting physically weaker and weaker and weaker. And when he saw his father, he had difficulty with that mirror back and, and the father had great difficulty seeing the son's sadness in looking at the father. I mean, look at the pain in that, right? Because the, the son wants the father to be healthy but the father's not getting healthy, and he can't get healthy, and he's, not getting, and he's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and the son is disappointed in the father and feels this extraordinary guilt that he mirrors back to his father, this pain, right? So how do you work through that, those emotions? It's really critical. Those, that's mirror theory. It changes. And you all know that, too. When you go into a hospital, I remember going to a hospital again with a woman who was physically getting, um, she, was, she, was, she was dying, and I, for the whole week, I was working at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Edmonton, and she was lying in bed. And, and um, for, for the week, the, one week, her sister had come out from Prince Edward Island to spend a week with her. And I was in to visit her every day. And she's bubbly and effervescent and full of life. And, and uh, they'd go, they'd go, they were able to go out for tea and things like this. Wonderful. Um, I went in, I think, on a Monday morning. I went in to see her. She looked like death. <laughs> and I, that's what I said to her because we had an honest relationship. I said, you're not looking too good today. <laughs> right? That's bedside manner. Um, and she looked up at me, and she started to cry, not because I said that to her, but because her sister had gone home. And I said, yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what's going on right now in you, because on the Sunday night, I saw her Monday morning, the Sunday night was the last time she was going to see her sister while she was alive. So. The mirror, so check it out, the mirror of the sister during that whole week was, they were 12-year-old girls again, right? They were 12, I could see my 12-year-old child in you. So having those mirrors is really critical. How we live with those mirrors is really important. Okay, I'm just gonna check my time. How much time do I have? Okay, three minutes, okay, now. All right, I'm gonna jump to the second page. The three most important things I can pass on to you tonight are these three things. It's really important to develop a covenant with people. So when I'm working with a person who's dying or living with the reality of death, the specter of death, I always work on having a covenant. I talk to my students about this all the time. The students get tired of me talking about this. So uh, I might say to somebody who is terminally ill, and even if they're my friend, and I've done this with my friends too, I said, what would you like me, how would you like me to work with you? How would you like me to be your companion? How would you like me to be with you? Um, I had a woman who said to me, Jody, I asked her that question. She said, I'd like to die with dignity. And I said, okay, I'll help you with that. And one day, I wrote about this in an article actually, and uh, she started yelling at her children. Right? And her children were school age, uh, late elementary. So she started yelling at her children. She'd bark at them. And her husband said to me, you know, my wife is really angry. So I went in to see her and I said, um, her name is Isabel. And I said, Isabel, um, can we talk about this? I don't want to talk about that. I said, but you asked me to help you die with dignity. And right now, I don't see a lot of dignity. The covenant holds the line. It means I love her. I love her. I'm going to talk to you about this thing. And then she opened up, started crying, and she said, Jody, and we just, I'm, I'm giving a short, short version of the, the, what, we, what we encountered. And she said, Jody, I feel the pressure of needing to give every ounce of parenting to my children right now. Right? So she felt enormous pressure, enormous rage at dying. Um, the other thing I've worked with people, a very, again, a really close friend of mine was dying, and he said, Jody, I don't want to die. I said, well, let's work on that. <laughs> so we worked on him living as long as he could. And this is what he said to me. Check this out. I'm going to say things I know that are going to bother you. So he was dying. And uh, OK, we got a minute left. So he said to me, uh, you know, people come into me. He was really dying. Like he was actively, actively, actively dying. And he said, people come into me, and they put their hand on my, on my arm. And they say, you know, it's OK. You can go. <laughs> And he said, you know, I'm holding on to this thing called life, like I'm clutching on to a life raft, 
and they're hitting my hands with a freaking nail hammer. <laughs> so I would say this is the last communication I had with him. The very last communication I had with him before he died was, you're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. And that was sustaining for him. Do you see this? That I'm not going to give up on you. You're going to live this life until the very, very end, if that's what you want to do. Which comes to my next point. This is the last point I'm going to make. And I got 25 seconds. This is the last thing, but really critical. It's called narcissistic equilibrium. And you should tattoo this on your forearm. Narcissistic equilibrium is this. It's when we treat people like they are competent human beings. Right? So always treat them like, so do you remember, you know, you used to see films where the dying, you know, I go in to say, I'm going to pick on Marion again because she's my buddy, but I'm your, I'm your caregiver. And I said, now, dear, how are you? Now, now, how are we feeling today? You know, those, you've heard those platitudes before, right? That, that undermines the fact she's an incredibly competent human being with an incredible story. Thank you. Yes, no, seriously, right? So I'll tell you this, so I had a dear friend of mine who was dying uh, of brain cancer. He was my lawyer. And I, I, I called him, so I, I, didn't, I, I had an issue. And my, and my wife, Beth, knew about narcissistic equilibrium. And narc it's not about narcissism. It's about having capacity. So he was actively dying. He'd given off his, his he's written off his, his, his power of eternity. So he wasn't going to do any of that stuff. But he was my lawyer. He was also my dear friend. I did his funeral. And um, so I called him, even though he had brain cancer. And I said to him, can I ask you, his name is Doug. I said, Doug, can I ask you a legal question? What happened to him when I asked him that? He brightened up for 30 minutes. He gave me a lecture on law. No, right? This is a guy who's actively dying. I said, can I ask you a legal question? He said, sure. I, I asked the question. 30 minutes later, he stops talking. Right? That's narcissistic equilibrium. We treat people with respect and dignity and watch them treat them. What do you want to do? What do you think you would like to do? See how the, the energy shoots up? So sustainability, when we talk about really difficult issues, my experience is, and this is what the dying have taught me, treat me like I'm alive, not like I'm dead. Treat me like I have integrity and a story. Don't treat me like I am some kind of pathetic little shell that's about to drift off that I'm so fragile. Treat me like a human being. Have real conversations with me. Uh, that's it for me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Reverend Dr. Clark. Uh, I think, thank you for talking about the physiological response of grief um, and through attachment, through relationships, our mirrors, uh, and also for uh, reminding us of treating people with dignity, uh, whatever stage of life, but dying. Um, again, we'll have a Q&A time uh, following our, our next two speakers. So our next guest this evening is the uh, Reverend Marion Lucas Jeffries. Um, now, Reverend Lucas Jeffries is a retired clergy of the Anglican Diocese of Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, though she does still tend to lead parishes from time to time, <laughs> as happens in the life of clergy. And due to her passionate care for creation, Marion leads the Diocesan Environment Network, whose mission is to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth, which is based on the fifth mark of mission of the Anglican Church of Canada. And I'm delighted to welcome her here this evening. So, thank you. Thank you, Joanne, and it's really wonderful to be here tonight. Um, to, I try to do whatever I can to support uh, the people involved in uh, promoting and encouraging others uh, in regards to green burial. Now, I'll tell you, I'm a sailor. And I wanted to let you, to, to, to share something with you. It's a poem written by an Australian, Bernard Thorogood. It's a poem that I heard of several years ago and I stumbled on it again just a few weeks ago. And it struck me that it could be applied to our relationship with the earth today. So here's how it goes. A litany to the ocean. The horizon is so far away, the waves surge forever and the ocean currents travel the globe. Our boat is so small, God's ocean is great. When the breakers shake the rocks and the storm crests splinter in foam, when the spray, salt spray stings the eyes and the gulls flee inland, 
Our boat is so small and God's ocean so strong. When the sea glistens and glows in the sun with colors like a song, shallows and deeps and restless tides sing noon and vespers, our boat is so small and God's ocean so alive. The wealth of the sea is its life to restore the balance of nature, to abound in the first living things and the species that feed us all. Our boat is so small and God's provision so great. Our harvesting can become plunder as we drive species towards extinction, not out of wickedness, but for food, for profit, for human need. Our nets are so urgent and God's gifts so long in the making. In the great ocean of God's eternal purpose, we often seem so small and our life so short and our understanding so childish. But our human needs are so great and rapidly expanding that we upset the balance of boat and sea. So I suspect that we might all agree that we have upset the balance of nature. As a result, we experience what is commonly known as climate grief. It's also planetary grief, all that grieves as our needs grow and our boat, this planet, becomes overloaded. Now I, have to, I had a conversation with a young man recently. He sent me a suicide note that he wrote, not because he was planning on killing himself, but to impress on others how desperate the climate crisis is and how desperate that makes him feel. Now he believes that we need to pull out all the stops and scare people to death, if you'll excuse the pun in this context, so they will take action. He said that we need to pull out all the stops when it comes to raising alarms about climate change. I told him I feel the opposite. I don't need to frighten people any more than they already are. I said that I believe that we need to empower people and encourage action by offering a sense of hope. Hope that we can make a difference. Hope that we can steer the boat in a different direction. Hope that we can plot a course that will prevent us from being dashed, dashed against the wreckage, the result of fossil fuels, carbon emissions, polluted land, air, and water. We came to the agreement that people need to feel both fear and hope. In my position as coordinator of the Diocesan Environment Network, I often find myself talking to people who have fear, who admit that they're afraid of this climate crisis and are also willing to admit that they don't know what to do about it. They feel paralyzed by fear and despair, that it's either too late to do anything about or it's too overwhelming a task. So I make every effort to provide hope, sometimes feeling myself, I have to admit, that I'm drowning in the grief that surrounds me. But I offer a reason, motivation, and options for taking action that will contribute to the possibility of a healthier, sustainable planet. Now, I also have to admit that it might be easier for me, now that I'm older, to deal with the climate crisis. If I were a young adult or teenager, might I feel more fear than I do? Might I be paralyzed by it? After all, I'm closer to the end of my life than the beginning, but to be honest, I'm still fearful myself for my grandchildren and what life will be like for them. However, I can't allow myself to be paralyzed by fear. In a sense, I feel more angst than anything else. So, like a life ring, I cling to the possibility that we can do something that will leave those who follow us when we're gone a place to live a sustainable life. And a planet that can sustain life, one that is battered today by waves of heat that threaten us, crops, threat to, threats to crops that sustain us in our homes, and that becomes so vulnerable when wildfires rage. As I began to consider what I'd say this evening, I sat in the cockpit of my sailboat on a mooring in Douglas Harbor, New Brunswick. It was a calm, peaceful evening, barely a ripple on the water. That day, September 4th, at almost 8 p.m., the temperature was in the high 20s. It was hot, and it promised to be hotter before nightfall and even hotter the next day. 
But isn't that the way the summer went this year? It was either hot, plus 30, and dry, or pouring rain that delivered floods. Now, I drove out of Nova Scotia mid-June while wildfires raged. I returned mid-July in time to experience up to, they say, 300 millimeters of rain and massive flooding while news broadcasts gave updates on record-breaking temperatures and fires raging in Europe, in the north, and out west. Every single night we heard about the effect of climate change on the news. I had a conversation recently, too, this is part of what I do, with a young woman who told me that as a couple, because of the climate crisis, her partner and her had decided not to have children because they feared for the next generation's future. Not uncommon these days. That young woman was looking for something that would give her hope. She didn't know what to do because she believed that anything she could do would be a drop in the bucket. When I asked her if she knew that there are a lot of groups out there dedicated to caring for the planet, including the church, she said that was new information to her. She didn't know. Telling her that was like throwing her a life ring. It gave her hope. Now, a man named Howard Sin wrote, to be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It's based on the fact that human history is a history of not only cruelty, but also compassion, sacrifice, courage, and kindness. If we only see the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act. In the church, we call them saints. And at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presence. And to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is itself a marvelous victory. So this not only applies to society but and societal ills, but to restoring a sick and suffering planet. But first we need knowledge because knowledge is power. If you don't read the newspaper, listen to the news on the radio, or watch the news on television, you might avoid the stress of climate disasters taking place, but you also become oblivious to the opportunities that do exist for making a difference. While listening to a podcast a week or so ago, research has proven that knowledge results in action. The more people know about what is happening and why, the more likely they are to act. Part of that knowledge, the next hurdle we face, is wrapped up in the question, what can I possibly do about it? The young woman I mentioned earlier was overwhelmed with both the options for action and the changes she would need to make in her life. You see, she thought that she couldn't do anything halfway if she was going to act. She thought that she had to commit fully and do it perfectly and all at once, that she had to jump in the deep end before learning to swim. Remembering that every journey begins by dipping one toe in the water, taking the first step, we should do what we can on any given day. Biting this climate crisis off in small chunks, taking the pressure off of us not to have to do it perfectly, freeing us to do what we can when we can. Each one of us, you know, has something to offer. We have choices. A few weeks ago, the headline appeared on the CBC website, Dartmouth Family Attempts to Live Net Zero. A family in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, it said, has been selected to participate in a new carbon reduction competition called Live Net Zero and put on by the Canadian Geographic magazine. Now, we don't have to launch out of the starting gate at top speed, and I'm sure that Dartmouth family didn't start the same way. We don't have to be a 10 out of a 10 all the time when it comes to recycling, for example. There are times when, when something prevents, this is my confession, <laughs> something prevents me from not being as green as I might be. But the more I practice acts of green, as my friend Claudia says, the more I can do and the better I do it. For this sailor, it's kind of like trimming the sails. I strive to get the most out of the wind, but conditions are variable and I learn from each trip out. 
A friend told me proudly that her husband and her have grown in their stewardship of the planet. Now, she boasted, they put every scrap of paper in the blue bag for recycling. Another bag holds plastic and glass. They use their green bin, but she proudly says that they waste so little food that it is never close to full. And she added that they have installed heat pumps. You see, the more we do, the more we strive to do. It becomes important. So I recently dropped an empty drink container in the water beside her sailboat, but fiercely determined to pollute as little as possible, I climbed down the ladder, hanging on with one hand Indiana Jones style, and reached down to scoop it up with the other hand before it sank or floated away. I was really impressed with myself, to tell you the truth. <laughs> so was my friend sitting in the boat with me. But as small, small as well as large acts of green all count, don't they? Every one of them. So the role of the Diocesan Environmental Network, Environment Network, aka DEN, is to help Anglicans strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. To change our unhealthy habits and reduce our dependency on things, stuff we have that we think we need that harm the, the earth. To reduce our impact on the earth and all those we share this planet with. The trees, the plants, the animals, fish and birds, all living things. And as I composed this, I thought, well, that's one big daunting job. But that isn't necessarily so. When I speak, I've been asking groups questions like, how many people here use recyclable coffee mugs or refillable water bottles? How many reduce their single-use plastics? How many recycle? How many compost? How many have installed heat pumps? How many have backyard gardens? And now I need to add the question to you. How many of you have chosen green burial? Well, Louisa, who follows me, will provide you with some of the knowledge you need to make an informed decision and act on it, so you will have knowledge. My job is to explain why. You know, we hear about climate change every single day, and most certainly this past summer, because of extreme weather either a drought and wildfires, or record-breaking rain and flooding. Not just here in Nova Scotia, but across Canada and around the world. We know that extreme weather puts all creatures at risk. We know that more species become extinct each year than ever before. We know that the planet is hotter than it's ever been. This summer, the temperature hit a record high globally. Given the fact that I'm not going to be around, especially when it comes to something like green burial, why should this be important to me? Because we're all invited to fall in love with this earth, this planet. Ched Myers, an American activist and theologian, says, we won't save a place we don't love. We can't love a place we don't know, and we can't know a place we haven't learned. You see, we wake up each morning, get out of bed, and go about our business. Do we really think about where we live? Do we consider the impact we have on this marvelous planet? When we talk about climate change, we often talk about saving trees and cute critters. But we also need, too, to consider our children, our grandchildren, and all the people we know and love. They, too, are going to be directly impacted by a planet that can no longer sustain life. How do we all get involved? In my humble opinion, as I said to my friend's coworker, each one of us offers what we can, then bit by bit we feel hope. When the young woman I spoke to asked me what gives me hope, I looked right back at her and said, the fact that you care gives me hope. So tonight, if you didn't care, you wouldn't be here. Knowing that you do care does give me hope. Thank you. Now, I know from being involved years ago in the development of a funeral co-op that it isn't easy to get people's attention when it comes to talking about funerals. At the time, all passers-by took a wide berth around our display table, even though it had important information about our options when it came to our impending death. It isn't something we want to spend a lot of time thinking about. But if we know that our funeral and burial will have less impact on the life of the planet 
then we raise the possibility of taking a giant step forward and not only making the decision to make a difference through our choice, <coughs> but being an example of a different understanding of burial practices and different practices that will influence others. And that's what you can do. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Lucas Jeffries. I appreciate your words this evening. Thank you for talking about the fear, acknowledging that, and the confusion that many of us experience, and yet the hope that there is surrounding the climate crisis, and for reminding us that knowledge can encourage action, and acts of green do matter. Thank you. So our final speaker for this evening is Louisa Horn who is the founder of Epilogue Transition Services and consultant at Best Practices Consulting. I also heard somebody refer to her this evening as a rock star, so <laughs> we'll see. Um, she is a natural burial enthusiast and senior transition specialist who is privileged to support families with a variety of transitions through her work with Epilogue. Louisa has completed training in advanced planning and community death care and has earned an end-of-life doula certificate. She is also a celebrant for funerals and celebrations of life and has studied grief and bereavement at AST, the Atlantic School of Theology. And Louisa is passionate about natural burial and is the first person in the, in the country uh, to have completed the Green Burial Council Proficiency Certificate, or Certification. So say that three times fast. Thank you so much, Louisa, for joining us this evening. Thank you. I'm going to move this up a bit, I think, and see if we have some slides. I have pictures to show you because this is this is a visual thing. I, I'm, I'm sort of doing visual thing here too. I've got my Penn Forest natural burial shirt. Penn Forest is in Pittsburgh, and my green shoes. So I'm set to go. So many shades of green. So we heard about acts of green. This is about many shades of green because as Marion said, we're not always a 10 out of 10. We're not always going to have everything perfect in our efforts to be as green as we can. And when we think about death care, there are many shades. And so I want to, to just go through what some of those are tell you very quickly a little bit about the difference in the language around natural and green because there's a difference in those and so just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing I start with that look a little bit at green cemeteries and what they involve and then green products so we can be at one end of the spectrum totally into it we can be somewhere along the spectrum or not so much and those are choices same as the choices that we make with what kind of car we drive and how we do our recycling and how we heat our homes there's a range of decisions to be made so we're going to look at green burial versus natural burial and I have a preference and my my far end of the spectrum the purest end would be looking at natural burial and then there's different shades of green as we go along so we're going to talk about that difference and mention very briefly the issue of green washing which you may know exists in many aspects of our life where products and suppliers give the aura or the sense of something being green but it may not actually be. So, a couple of different ways that we can think about how we look after our bodies when we die, what disposition method we use, that's the terminology of that. And I thought I'd start with one called aquamation, because you'll see a picture in the middle of a fairly well-known Anglican who chose that particular approach. And aquamation has a number of different words that describe it. People use different phrases depending on their preference and the kind of impact they want to have with it and how scientific they want to be or whether they want to kind of make it sound a little bit softer. Uh, so we might hear flameless cremation or water cremation or the more scientific term alkaline hydrolysis, not so friendly from a marketing perspective, or resumation. And this is basically uh, like cremation in that the end result is a, a, a sandy substance, the ground teeth and bones that we have when we do a flame cremation, but instead of using flame, it uses heated water with some chemicals, lye to be precise, in a machine that looks a little bit like that, and Desmond Tutu chose this as his green option. So he called this a green way to go. Well. 
It's greener than some other things. Still uses a fair bit of energy. A bit of fossil fuel involved in heating that big device up. Some energy involved in flipping it around a few times as it, uh, as it does its thing. Um, but it's greener than some other things. What about composting? Human composting is something that's popular in some places. It's not legal here, so we don't do it, but Canadians have traveled across the border, and that shows a few pictures of, of some of the devices that are used for that, where bodies are put in containers, and you'll see some that look like a giant bathtub. This comes out of the world of agriculture because this has been used in farming for some time, where animal bodies might be put in a container with other organic material. They warm up, as you would imagine, in that kind of an environment, and over time, everything returns to the earth. Pretty darn natural, right? So that's an option, just not a legal one here. But people are doing it elsewhere. Okay, what about cremation? That must be greener. That must be something that, uh, that people think is green, and isn't that why a lot of people choose it? Well, again, it's on that spectrum. How green is it? Okay, look at those pictures there. You see a pretty significant bit of fossil fuel being used for that, that machine, obviously. We might call it a variety of names. In the, in the cremation world, it's called a retort. In another world, it might be called an incinerator, because that's basically what's happening there. We've got very high heat. We've got lots of, of uh, emissions coming out of those, those stacks that are there. We've got all kinds of things. I'm not going to go through all of the, all of the uh, specific points. You can read them there, because I don't want to get the hook either. There's something about that, as Jody said, that <laughs> attack of a candy cane. Um, but certainly, it may be greener in some respects if people are thinking about the land that's used. And that's often the argument that people make when they say, well, cremation is much greener because I'm not using that land. You're using a lot of fossil fuel in the process. There are toxicity issues with the results. And in fact, I brought this is a bag of neutralizing material that can be added to uh, cremated remains to address the fact that cremated remains are extremely high pH. They're actually toxic to plants, so you'll hear stories about the certain hole on the golf course where the grass doesn't look as green, or places where people find they've, they've uh, planted something and spread some remains, and gee, the plant didn't do so well. That's because the remains are toxic at that point. So unless you add, I don't know if everybody carries a bag of this in their trunk, but I do. Um, so, you know, you can add that. It's kind of handy to have. You never know when you're going to need to neutralize some remains. Uh, so. Greener, but where is it on the spectrum? Okay, I'll say that th those are, are things that we need to know about, part of this knowledge idea, that there are options, and just as we make choices about a hybrid car or an e-vehicle, or we're waiting for hydrogen, or we don't care, we're somewhere along that spectrum as we make our choices for our death care as well. So, whoa, what just happened? I don't know, we can fix that while I keep talking. Uh, so with, with natural burial and the purest sense with what I'm going to continue talking about, maybe it just kind of went off of its, off of its thing. We're going to focus on the nat natural side. Thank you. So I'm, t I'm talking about that end of the spectrum where we're not adding to the toxicity. We're looking at the natural process of a full body, not a cremation, a full body being buried in the earth so that it goes back to the earth without the issues that we would see. Is it legal? Absolutely it's legal in Nova Scotia. In fact, the, the uh, provincial government has put out a policy paper that basically says it meets all the same criteria as everything else within the acts that we follow within the province of Nova Scotia for how we treat bodies and how we deal with death care. Green burial is absolutely legal. Lots of interest. It's increasing. You'll see this in other places more so than here. That's why I got my shirt on from Pittsburgh. This is in the city of Pittsburgh that Penn Forest exists, one that I visited quite recently, and very, very popular in terms of the growth of people interested in sustainable and environmental ways to treat their body at the end of their life. So they're making decisions all through their life to, to recycle and do all of the things that they do with cycling or whatever else. They want that final decision to be in in alignment with those same values. And that's really what we're trying to, to do with this. Now, now I'm not going forward. Oh, there we go. 
So, not new. This has been around a long time. It was way back that this is what people did all of the time before we started to have other practices and rituals become part of our, our regular life. Now, I don't know why this has taken a while to go, but there we go. So, what we see in many parts of the world, and with some faiths, this is very much their, their standard. And we're seeing growth, particularly in the United States and the United Kingdom, where there are hundreds of natural burial forests or meadows. There are different types of environments where we see this. And these photographs are from some of these that give you a sense of what the conservation style of natural burial looks like. Not all natural burial happens in a forest or in a meadow. It can happen in the municipal cemetery in Halifax. Halifax Municipal Cemeteries accept and are quite happy with people choosing to have a green burial within that existing contemporary cemetery. That is possible. Right? So it doesn't have to be the full end of the spectrum of a conservation one. I don't think it likes being up here. I'm going to skip that. So where are we doing this? mostly in the US and the UK, but we are seeing growth in Canada. We have a number of certified, through the Green Burial Society of Canada, uh, cemeteries, one in particular in Nova Scotia, which I'll mention in a minute, but we see hundreds, literally, in the US and in the UK. So there you're seeing a forest and a meadow. So the Atlantic Canada scene, Hatchet Lake, here in Nova Scotia is the only certified through the Green Burial Society cemetery that we have that is considered a hybrid. So it has a contemporary cemetery area, and then a, it also has a dedicated green area. And so there are some photographs there that come from that one. We also have others that, that promote themselves as welcoming and encouraging green burial. And as I mentioned, the Halifax Municipal Cemeteries are in that category now. So we see a range of possibilities, and I would venture to say that there are a lot more cemeteries that would be open to green burial than we know about, because in many cases it just takes a conversation. So I've had those conversations for folks that say, well, I've already made a choice, I want to be in such and such a cemetery in the valley, and when I called, they didn't know anything about it. Well, let's have a conversation, right? Let's have a conversation with them and help them understand what this means because it may not mean any difference in terms of their practices. It may just mean them understanding a little bit about what you're choosing to do with respect to the container and how you're going to go about that. Whoa, jeepers, what's going on here? <laughs> okay, so lots of places for information. As Samarian said, knowledge is power in this case. And so through organizations like the Green Burial Council, fantastic website in the US, Green Burial Society of Canada, we have in Nova Scotia, we're very fortunate to have a Green Burial Society of Nova Scotia that focuses on education and advocacy. And the chair and vice chair are sitting right there. So anybody that wants to know about that, We've got lots of information and lots of activity there. And then there's a natural burial group in Ontario. So lots of information, lots of people involved. So quickly, what is it? What is a green or natural burial? There are five principles, and we're going to just whiz through them. But again, these pictures, I think, are important to give you a sense of what is possible. Right? There's no rules about how this works. There's all kinds of possibilities about how a natural burial can happen. Number one rule, no embalming. Embalming's not as common as it once was anyway, but certainly if you're looking at a green or natural burial, that kind of, of chemical use is not part of the idea. Now, there are supposedly eco embalming um, materials that are available now, and I'm sure this will continue to evolve. But certainly in a, in a um, typical green or natural burial, there would be no embalming. Direct earth burial. This means the body is going into the earth without anything else happening. And you'll see pictures there of different containers that are being used. But it's very much a, a focus on that, on that uh, full body burial. Having said that, in places like Penn Forest, natural burial, and other places, because many people have chosen for a variety of reasons to opt for cremation, there are ways to make that, as I said, my little bag of stuff here, um, to make that more green than it might have otherwise been. 
I think it's me moving this thing in the wrong way. Ecological restoration and conservation. The idea with a natural burial is that you're not taking land and using it for burial and nothing else, because if we think about our contemporary cemeteries, they're not really land, land areas that can be used for other purposes, right? They're not restoring land. They're not making land better than it was before. With natural burial, the idea is that you are doing that. You are improving the land, you're restoring it, and you're making it better. So if we look at that picture on the bottom of rows and rows of stones, can be quite lovely if that's what you're looking for, if that's the, the environment that you want to be, but it's not land that can be used for other purposes. Whereas in the natural burial scenario on the top, that land has many uses and uh, is certainly part of the restoration. Memorialization. Generally, we would see communal memorialization where we would have uh, in the middle, for example, Ray, who's here from, uh, took that photograph at a, at a green cemetery or a natural cemetery in the UK where there's a, a pillar, I guess I'll call it, with a number of names there. But we also see natural materials like boulders. We certainly have lots of boulders in Nova Scotia. And one of the areas that we're working on to develop a conservation site in Nova Scotia like much of the province, has lots of glaciation and lots of boulders around, and so those can be used to have the memorialization on those. Um, in a couple others that I visited, there you'll see a lot of use of GPS and QR codes and lots of different ways to use technology. Key thing is it's not going to have rows of stones that probably came from the other side of the planet to get here. And the final one, it's optimizing the use of land. So other things are happening there. So I think one of my pictures is uh, yoga with goats. That's at Penn Forest. Unfortunately, the day that I was there, they did not have yoga with goats. I really, really wanted to do yoga with goats, but I didn't get to. I'll have to go back. Um, but there's obviously in many of these, there's hiking. There are all kinds of opportunities for other ways to enjoy nature, whether it's bird watching, forest schools, hiking, walks, exercise, lots of ways to optimize the land. And then I wanted to speak just very briefly about the, the containers that happen. So biodegradable, obviously. Caskets and urns that are biodegradable. So here are some caskets and urns. One of those, I've got one on my table in the back. If you want to have a look, it's a, I don't carry around a casket. I haven't figured that one out in the trunk of my car. But I can carry a, a wooden urn. So I do have one locally made, New Brunswick. Uh, so I have that to show you. People really like the wicker. Wicker could be lovely. But where did it come from? In this particular case, that one came from the other side of the planet. So you have to look at the whole picture. Right? Maybe you say, I really, really want a wicker casket because it's biodegradable. This is true. But what about the carbon footprint that was involved in bringing it from Asia? How does that fit? Right? So that's the, the many shades again, right? Um, wooden ones, plain, obviously lots of different ways of doing that. You'll see a picture on the top there in the corner of a bookcase. Uh, Jeremy Burrell in New Brunswick who makes that one and made the urn that I have makes ones that start out life as a bookcase so you could get one of those now. Put it together, it's a bookcase, paint it, have the kids paint it, use water-based paints to decorate it and when you need it pull out the shelves, tip it over and away you go. <laughs> Pretty simple, it's very efficient, very efficient. I have one on order, I'll have it in a couple of weeks, just have to go get it. Shrouds. You can use grandma's quilt. You can make your own. You can use a sheet, cotton, linen, silk, biodegradable again. No buttons, no zippers, same as the caskets, have no hinges or metal on them. They are completely biodegradable. You can do that. That's all part of a natural burial. And then just to finish off, then there's all those other things that we sometimes do that, again, along that spectrum, you need to think about when you're trying to decide how green, how many acts of green am I going to include here. So that's everything from the paper that you use, the laminating of stuff that you do, the styrofoam cups that you use, the balloons, terrible in many ways, all of those kinds of things are moving you along the spectrum. The flowers, where did they come from? Did they come from the other side of the planet? Do they have foil? Do they have foam? Do they have plastic? 
right? If you're going to be a purist on this, you're not going to have any of those things. You're going to have local flowers with nothing on them, no wire that's going to make them not biodegradable. Uh, cars, how many people are driving and how are they getting there? What kind of a reception are you having and where did all of that come from and how recyclable is that? I've even got some joints there. Joints are recyclable in many cases, um, not if you're doing a full body, but uh, they're not recyclable and reused for another person, like don't, don't get me wrong. When I say recyclable here, I mean the metal. Okay, moving on, moving on, moving on. But all of those are things to think about. So I think my time is pretty much up, so I'm going to stop there so we can have some questions. Um, but these are the kinds of things that you would think about as you're looking at that spectrum. And think about it like so many other things in our lives and how we decide what acts of green are going to be important for us as we think about sustainability. And it's all of those things. And there's a spectrum for them all. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. I did a little bit of a double take when you said joints, but now I get it. Um, <laughs> so thank you for explaining the many shades of green of natural burial and the many ways we can choose green to natural burial and legally. And uh, so now we're going to just adjust the front stage here. So I encourage you to take a five minute break. There's some coffee and tea and juice and, and nibblies. Um, and then we'll come back for a time of Q&A. Uh, and I hope you've saved some excellent questions. So five minutes and we'll, I, don't worry though, I won't come after you with a cane. <laughs>